Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Stephanie and Daniel Polit? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Stephanie Kirkpatrick Polite was born on January 16, 1985, in Corsicana, Texas. This is about an hour south of Dallas. She lived with her parents, Neil and Cynthia, and had a younger brother named Dean. Stephanie was described as intelligent, outgoing, and assertive. She developed a love of performing. At the age of six, she played Little Red Riding Hood in a community theater production. In July 1998, 13-year-old Stephanie moved with her family to Sugarland, Texas, which is just southeast of Houston. She attended a Catholic all-girls high school starting in 1999 and was active in the choir. In 2003, she graduated and moved to Indiana, where she attended the University of Notre Dame. In 2007, she graduated with a bachelor's degree in psychology and liberal studies. Stephanie returned to Sugarland, Texas, and started working for the Monarch School in Houston, this is a school for individuals with neurological symptoms. She attended the University of Houston and earned a master's degree in special education. During this time, Stephanie was also active in community theater. Eager to find love and start a family, Stephanie started searching for a romantic interest. A friend of hers from college introduced her to a man named Daniel Mark Polite, and the couple became romantically involved. Daniel was described as being heavily into video games and possessing little ambition. Despite his potential shortcomings, Stephanie found Daniel to be a suitable romantic partner. The couple married in December 2011. They purchased a house a few miles away in Missouri City, Texas. It was located on the 1400 block of Green Cottage Lane. Stephanie continued to teach, but Daniel decided to quit his job and return to school to study engineering. Unfortunately for Daniel, his performance in school was substandard. On one occasion, Stephanie came home to find Daniel playing video games when he should have been in class. With only Stephanie's income available to support the couple, they experienced financial difficulties. During a party in February of 2014, Stephanie consumed excessive quantities of alcohol and talked to a friend about leaving Daniel. Other people reported that Daniel verbally mistreated Stephanie around this time. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On March 11, 2014, at 11.26 p.m., 30-year-old Daniel Polite called 911 and reported that something was wrong with his wife, Stephanie. He told the operator, I don't know what's wrong with her, but she's drowning in her own blood. He explained how he and Stephanie were drinking vodka when all of a sudden Stephanie started vomiting. The 911 call lasted 15 minutes, during which Daniel made some unusual statements. For example, he talked about how they were in the bedroom and it looked like a murder scene. And he referred to his wife's physical appearance by saying, quote, you know, you're so pretty, very pretty. You're a very pretty girl, unquote. The operator directed Daniel to move Stephanie from the bed to the floor and begin CPR. When the police arrived at the scene, Daniel met them at the door covered in blood. He motioned to the bedroom where the police found 29-year-old Stephanie on the floor. Paramedics attempted to render aid, but found that she was already dead. They noticed that she had a gunshot wound to the back of her head, and a Ruger SP-101 revolver was found a few feet from her body. A police officer ordered Daniel to go to the living room and sit down, but Daniel was not cooperative. The officer threatened him with a taser and handcuffed him. He then placed Daniel in his police cruiser, which had a dash cam as well as an internal microphone. Daniel could be heard crying as he sat in the back of the vehicle. A few minutes later, at 12.22 a.m., now on March 12, Daniel could be heard talking in the police cruiser. He said, quote, Quite frankly, I didn't do anything wrong. All I did was call 9 blanking 11 to say that she was bleeding out, so blank you, unquote. At 12.25 a.m., a detective asked Daniel if he would agree to be interviewed at the police station. Initially, Daniel consented to be interviewed, but then said, quote, 
If you are insinuating some wrongdoing, I would really like to have a lawyer before I talk to anybody, unquote. At 12.49 a.m., the detective asked Daniel for consent to search his house. Daniel refused to grant consent. After the police cruiser door was closed, he exclaimed, I'm blanked. The blank is a word that rhymes with luck, something that for Daniel just ran out. He continued by saying, blank you, oh you blank blank. The last blank was a word that rhymes with pitch. The authorities assumed that Daniel was referring to his wife when he made this offensive statement. Here's what the police found in Daniel's house as they continued with their investigation. Stephanie was killed by a single gunshot wound to the back of the head as she was in bed. She was on her left side with her left cheek on her pillow. When the gun was discharged, it was at least 12 to 15 inches away from her head. There was a photograph of Stephanie on Daniel's phone. It was taken at 11.04 p.m., 22 minutes before Stephanie was killed. The image appeared to feature Stephanie asleep with her left cheek on her pillow. This didn't look too good for Daniel. The evidence was consistent with the theory that he had photographed his wife when she was asleep and then shot her as she continued to sleep. Daniel was charged with murder and released on bond. His trial started on October 25, 2016. The jury only deliberated for an hour and a half before convicting him of murder on November 7. Three days later, Daniel was sentenced to 85 years in prison. He will be eligible for parole after 30 years in the year 2046, when he is about 62 years old. Now moving to my analysis. Daniel maintains his innocence. At his trial, his defense argued that the shooting was an accident. Daniel saw Stephanie with the revolver in her hand and was concerned for her safety because she was intoxicated. He tried to take the weapon away from her, but during the struggle, the gun discharged. Out of all the places the bullet could have traveled, it just happened to strike Stephanie in the back of the head. The state, of course, is pleased with the conviction. They believe that Daniel simply shot Stephanie in the head as she was sleeping, although they were unsure of his motive. This brings me to the question, was Daniel guilty of murder? Let's take a look at the evidence, both for and against the idea that Daniel was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. There were only two people in the house when Stephanie was shot. It's clear Stephanie was not the shooter, considering the gun was discharged at least one foot away from the back of her head as she was asleep. On the 911 call, Daniel claimed that he did not know what happened to his wife. He acted as if it was some mystery when he knew that his wife had been shot. Daniel told the police that he could not remember a gun being fired. From jail, he told his parents the story about the gun discharging during a struggle and still maintained that he never heard a gunshot. Later, when Daniel was out on bail, he spoke to Stephanie's father on the phone. The story he offered this time was a little different. Daniel noted that Stephanie was intoxicated. He claimed that she found the revolver. He tried to intervene and tripped over shoes, which somehow caused the shooting. The story is neither coherent nor believable. Daniel communicated with a girlfriend right before the shooting, so he was cheating on his wife. Daniel had a secret folder on his phone with clothing-challenged photographs of this girlfriend. She even visited him in jail. Daniel made statements in the back of the police cruiser that made him seem detached, sadistic, and hateful. One could interpret his statement, I'm blanked, as an admission of guilt. Why would he have felt that way if he was innocent? Daniel had a few possible motives to commit murder in addition to having an affair. Stephanie wanted him to sell his Ford Mustang. The couple was in financial distress, and Daniel was struggling in college. He may have felt like a failure compared to Stephanie. Moving to the exculpatory factors, state experts could not rule out the possibility that the shooting was accidental. Stephanie was both depressed and intoxicated. She was going through a rough time. Her blood alcohol content was nearly three times the legal limit for driving a motor vehicle. Maybe she did want to bring harm to herself. Daniel's story may have changed somewhat, but every time he retold the story, he maintained the claim that the shooting was an accident. That part never changed. Daniel may have made the I'm blanked statement simply because he knew the evidence did not look good for him. As far as his unkind statement about his wife, Stephanie, maybe he was angry with her for grabbing the revolver. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Daniel Polite was guilty? 
Yes, I believe he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Stephanie had some mental health difficulties. For example, she once struggled with an eating disorder, and at the time of her death, she was depressed and had a drinking problem. Despite this, she was productive and successful. Daniel also had problems. He was insecure, self-centered, envious, lazy, impulsive, irresponsible, callous, detached, deceptive, sadistic, obsessed with video games, and having an affair. He had a sense of entitlement, had verbally mistreated Stephanie, and had caused financial problems for him and his wife. Stephanie probably did not know about the infidelity, but still realized that she could do better than Daniel. She was looking to separate from him, but delayed this endeavor to focus on alcohol consumption. Daniel also believed that he could do better, and he found a girlfriend. Lost in the euphoria of infidelity, he devalued his wife and thought about killing her. This was his motive. It was not based on embarrassment, anger, or his wife's desire to sell his car. It was the prospect of an alternative lover. Just like Stephanie was intoxicated on alcohol, Daniel was intoxicated on infidelity. On March 11, 2014, Daniel communicated with his girlfriend and became increasingly excited about a future with her. He strongly desired to become untangled from his wife, therefore he made a homicidal commitment. As Stephanie slept, Daniel stood over the bed and looked at her in a creepy fashion, which was easy because it came naturally for him. He even took a photograph of her sleeping. This is how Daniel wanted to remember his wife. He was trying to make the upcoming homicide seem poetic, necessary, merciful, and justified. He convinced himself that he was the victim, as if Stephanie was preventing him from experiencing happiness. Daniel retrieved the revolver and shot his wife one time in the head. Only after the shooting did he spend some time thinking about how to escape responsibility. In the police cruiser, he referred to his wife using an unkind term because he blamed her for the outcome. In the time leading up to his conviction, Daniel desperately wanted everyone, including friends and relatives, to believe that he was not the killer. Rather, he was a good man. Just like his effort to escape a conviction, his mission to prove his goodness was unsuccessful. Those are my thoughts on the case of Stephanie and Daniel Polite. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.